I'm going to kick off the uh, design and make introduction. That's all right. So I'm Martin Self, I'm director of the uh, Design and Make programme. Um, relatively young programme in the Graduate School, established um, three years ago, the first uh, full cycle. Um, most of you will have heard my introduction to Hook Park, um, whenever that was, eight or nine days ago. Um, for those who weren't paying attention, so the AA, as well as owning this campus, um, kind of remarkably owns um, a large chunk of woodland in the west of England in Dorset called Hook Park a 350-acre um, working forest. Um, yeah, he took this on in 2002, inherited this um, piece of land and an existing small campus in the centre of the woodland. Um, this was um, built, the original campus buildings were built in the uh, 1980s and 90s as a furniture college, really interesting um, experimental buildings um, built from the uh, surrounding woodland. Um, they're centred around this Fiotto designed workshop. Um, this is used a lot by London-based students travelling out, um, doing short visits to Hook Park and using the workshop. Um, alongside the workshop itself, there's obviously the woodland as well as a site for experimentation and um, various projects. Another thing the AA inherited was um, planning permission for a larger campus. Um, we took that on and sort of redrew it. Um, that's the kind of block layout of the, uh, the buildings that we have permission to build at Hook Park. So um, over the next 10 years or so, we're going to be substantially expanding that campus. And Design and Make was proposed alongside that planning permission as, the, as a vehicle for delivery of that, um, a, a vehicle for a sort of novel form of um, education at master's level um, where we're able to actually construct the buildings we're designing. So fundamentally, it's about realisation of actual projects for real permanent structures um, in this rural context. So it gives us a really unique opportunity to um, you know, not just fully engage in the kind of material aspects of, um, you know, the sort of material technical aspects, but also the aspects of having our own landscape, our own site, our own place to work with. Just to quickly summarise the building's um, projects to date, so the first of the design and make cycles we, we uh, designed and built um, this big shed construction so it's a large assembly workshop that's now the, the mothership, effectively, for design and make a big assembly workspace. Um, along sort of parallel with that, <coughs> we completed this caretaker's house project, um, student design project, which the um, sort of on-site family, the cook, the, the workshop manager, the caretaker um, family live in that. <coughs> and then in the uh, most recent cycle, um, the first of the student lodge accommodations, so a timber-framed building kind of nestled in the landscape. Uh, we've got two more projects currently on site, which I'll explain a little bit later on. Before that, a little uh, sort of slightly theoretical interlude. Um, you know, our fundamental agenda is making is design. Um, you know, looking at opportunities to kind of radically or uh, novelly uh, integrate the processes of making within design activity. Sort of motivations for that, um, I guess, stem from sort of underlying um, kind of embodiment arguments, I suppose. Um, this is a sort of educational theorist. When a word is deprived of its dimension of action, reflection automatically suffers as well. The word is changed into idle chatter, into verbalism, into an alienated and aliating blah. That's what we want to avoid. <laughs> um, the alternative is maybe s posited through Senate's recent book about the craftsman. The craftsman way of working provides forethought and anchor in material reality, enacted through the special human condition of being engaged. The motivation for this engagement comes from a drive for metamorphosis, the drive to change form. As a species, we have an immense capacity to change form. Um, that's a city in the background. That's a, a human-made whole. Um, you know, our, our sort of ability to sympathise with physical action is extreme. You know, we witness something like that, we're fascinated, we, sh we sort of share in the uh, physical action that's happening. Um, as Wolf Lynn theorised, you know, we judge architecture through our bodies, um, you know, the, the sort of um, physical form, how we judge form is interpreted through movement and um, forces and action. 
So we can extend that argument, I guess, into construction, you know, as a sort of fundamental um, component of architecture and as a sort of fundamental way of judging it. Um, and I suppose, you know, through the program we, I guess, test the implications of the sort of readability of construction in the uh, architectural output. So sort of two extremes there, you know, a very heavily predetermined, you know, heavily engineered structure on the left, um, the kind of opposite. Um, in a way, satisfying the same thing, obviously, be the structural kind of problems, but, um, you know, an ad hoc um, solution to the structural problem, very different kind of formal output. So design and make um, sits um, in, a, in the kind of very small family of other um, design build programs, a couple of them listed there. Um, and I guess also sits in the context of the AA's very special history of um, full scale work. So I think for a long time, I mean, Brett, Brett talks well about this, you know, the AA's had a um, fairly unique history in full scale prototyping. I guess there's an underlying argument that architecture as an action itself is, is prototypical. You know, we do projects as one-offs. Um, and just, you know, the site outside here is, um, has a history of that kind of activity. At Hook Park, I guess we can take that a stage further because we have the sort of opportunities presented by having our own kind of world, our own site. So I guess there's just four kind of axes to what we're doing. The material one, you know, that we, we inhabit our our own material to a large extent. You know, we're surrounded by 30,000 trees. We can, you know, very immediately um, access those, fell them, saw them up, and, you know, be working with them. I think I showed this uh, diagram the other day, which is the species distribution and the time distribution of their felling. So, kind of multiplying these two together, you have the future um, available construction material at Hook Park. Um, quite a kind of um, I don't know, quite a responsibility to uh, kind of analyse that and use that intelligently and integrate it with the forestry activity. Uh, I guess construction I've already sort of been hinting at in the earlier words. Um, just the, the directness of actually working material, of actually moving structure around. You know, it's, um, it's a con concrete experience. You know, it's not abstracted, it's not formalised into equations. It's directly adding to your intuition as designers at various scales. Um, I guess the other two terms um, may be less prime in the program, but I think still very valid, you know, that we, you know, the students live in Dorset, they inhabit this world, they get muddy, they get wet, you know, they, they are faced with the realities of actually being in an environment that we're providing shelter for, so there's a directness of that. And I think another term which we're sort of negotiating and trying to build up a little bit through some of the seminar activity is just how do we really engage in you know, a real place. It's, very, it's a very different environment to London, which is a, you know, it's a global city. This is a very um, kind of localised, historicised environment. You know, the, the immediate landscape has, you know, Iron Age landscape in it that hasn't been touched for 3,000 years. You know, there's, how do you kind of work in that, in that world? Um, and I suppose sort of underlying that is a bit of a kind of, um, I suppose, English vernacular awareness, at least, you know, that we do sit in a context, we are building buildings, you know, in, you know, in England, in the real world. Um, so there's things to study, like, you know, this is a geological map. Traditionally, you know, buildings are built out of their kind of relatively local materials. Um, you know, how do we kind of approach those arguments in a contemporary way? Okay, so there's three core staff, myself, um, Stuart Dodd, who also teaches in intermediate school, Charlie Brentnell, just to quickly kind of show a little bit of our background. So I, with um, Charles Walker, um, on an intermediate unit, which was a pavilion design build unit, that kind of led into the uh, design and make program for me. Um, Stuart Dodd has an interesting practice, works quite a lot in the area of Hook Park. He also runs um, yeah, an intermediate unit and um, a visiting school in Eugene, a design build program there. That was what they built a few weeks ago. Um, Charlie Brentnell, is our, what we call the make tutor. So he leads the kind of construction thinking within the program. He's an exceptional one-off guy. He's built a load of very intriguing um, structures. And he also has a unique skill at working with um, underskilled teams. So this is a bunch of primary school kids building a bike shelter. You know, he, he has the, the knack to find the ways to get projects to happen. So, um, you yeah, know, as an asset for us, it's 
It's fantastic. We also have um, other team of consultant tutors who um, who chip in. And joining us this year is Alice Fox, the landscape architect. Um, her practice is very kind of I don't know sympathetic, I guess, for the design and make agenda. So we're going to be seeing how how we can use her within the within the agendas. Um, this is kind of the map of the year. So we're a 60 month program um, for academic terms and then a summer period where we tend to carry on constructing to make the most of the summer. Um, the basic pattern is the first term is kind of introductory, introductory preliminary um, studios and seminars. And then after Christmas, we go straight into the, um, you know, the main design build project. So there's kind of a term of preparation um, I guess two and a half terms of designing and producing the uh, the built project, and then a thesis, which you know has been formulated sort of through through the summer, and then is written up um, through the end of the fourth term and, and over Christmas. So I'll go through this in a bit more detail. Um, okay, there's a the breakdown of the marks. It's in the handbook for the students. Um, okay, so we we have. Um, for seminar series that run, um, the two kind of prime ones are in the first term. So I teach um, a course, I guess, around the theories and practices of, of um, making his designs. So a sort of series of arguments um, that I guess build up a kind of theoretical basis around the, the practice that we do. Um, I guess to explore the, <coughs> the kind of locality ruralist theme that I was hinting at earlier. And um, we do two full day sessions um, around that topic. Okay, in terms of design make studios, um, so we kick off um, with an induction studio, which is a sort of boot camp, I guess, in terms of establishing digital skills and kind of getting a foundation of activities together. And that feeds into um, sort of furniture scale, uh, materials, kind of material structural system um, exploration. Um, last year we introduced an aspect of that brief which was quite good fun which was to seek out a traditional making technique kind of analyse the um, sort of inherent um, systems and logics within that technique codify that so model that out in Grasshopper or some other scripted technique and then sort of reinvent that technique in a, in a contemporary way so so Megan here, she, you know, Bridport is known as a, Bridport's our local town, it's known as a, um, it's a net making town. So you kind of analyse the, you know, the kind of traditional tools for net making, kind of established um, digitally um, control over that kind of technique, and then reinvented those tools driven by the, um, the digital tool. Um, this was another, so these, these, um, these projects are done individually by the students. This is a really kind of intriguing one. So um, I think Stephanie, she was talking to the forester about just the history of English forests. Um, a lot of, curiously, a lot of um, the old plantations have trees that look kind of like this. They were deliberately manipulated to um, provide timber for boat building. Um, boat building being the kind of the main use of timber historically. So you know, there's actually a kind of matching of tree geometry and its structural performance to the boat structure. Um, she kind of saw a contemporary version of that, so she went out, she, um, out of Hook Park saplings, pulled out a whole load of, load of knuckle joints, analysed them um, three-dimensionally, digitised that geometry, so each one of these things has a unique geometry, and then set up a um, sort of scripted technique that recomposed those joints into a sort of dome structure. Kind of intriguing if you take that to its sort of Logical, you know, logical kind of conclusion that you could scan the whole woodland and then use the timber components in their kind of idealised, naturally optimised form. So kind of fun, you know, these are just four-week projects which, you know, hopefully prompt ideas for, for future experiments. So that's a, those are done individually and at kind of a you know, desktop scale. Um, by this point, we've moved fully down to Hook Park. Um, students are living down there, and the next exercise is to really engage in some full-scale kind of inhabitable work. So, you know, within this sort of history of, um, you know, large, you know, real scale um, construction experimentation. So this was, I'll, I'll show a couple of examples. Um, this is an interesting cocoon project that a couple of guys did. This was a year and a half ago. Um, 
So here, I guess there's a few things being explored. One of them was a kind of construction approach, which was rather than kind of calculating structure or predetermining it, just basically bandaging, wrapping until you know a, a substantial structure emerged. Um, so I guess a kind of ad hoc, non-predetermined approach. And I guess the other motivation of this was to really kind of um, intimately wrap it into the landscape. So you know, very tightly wrapped between these three trees. Um, this is one from last year. So here the sort of brief was to use forest floor material, so kind of waste thin material just from the forest floor, so stuff that was lying around, um, very simple kind of bound connections, and then to um, accumulate through a sort of self-accessing um, scaffolding um, to build as high as possible in the trees, aiming to get a view of the sea, which that's me up there, I think, um, which was achieved. Um, this was happening in parallel, another little group of three students just going to be exploring the grid shell technique, um, quite challenging to do um, in a very short time frame. And again, trying to take it a step further and sort of really locate it explicitly in, in the landscape. So, you know, bringing that thing, the prefabricated piece, down into the woodland. Um, this is another one, again, very kind of site located um, piece. So this year, I think I mentioned Alice Foxley joining as a landscape tutor. So the brief for this is going to be even more explicitly, let's um, engage deeply in the, in the landscape, um, its realities, you know. Um, OK, that more, more or less closes the first term. We end with what we call project formulation. So at this point, we set the brief for the um, constructed project for the following year. Um, and we have a little phase of basically working out the kind of concept reaction to that, so students drawing up proposals and proposing it back to the school at the end of the term. That kind of sets up a concept direction for the, for the project when we come back in the new year. Um, I think this year we're probably not going to be taking on um, any of the kind of full-scale permanent buildings, but rather fitting something into the, um, the landscape infrastructure or maybe the biomass energy system, so um, contributing to the um, landscape furniture or perhaps um, the chip store or some other um, part of the uh, the infrastructure at Hook Park. Um, okay, so after Christmas, we run into um, the core design and make activity, you know, designing and realizing natural building. Um, we sort of separate this into two phases. The, the project studio, which in principle closes with the design fully um, defined, and then the making activity, the construction activity that runs on um, through the summer. Just to kind of quickly run through that, so obviously the design process is very you know, model-driven, working a lot out, working <coughs> closely with engineers, um, doing full-scale prototyping where we need it, kind of coming to understand solutions, you know, not just from textbooks, but, but from our actual physical world around us, you know, sourcing material, um, you know, and getting that into the drawn state that you need to have to, uh, to actually proceed with the project. Um, you know, then we go into the you know, the make studio phase, so the actual construction phase. So for that, we have um, you know, a bunch of staff that we draw on to supervise that. Um, I'll illustrate this with the two current projects that are on site now. So, you know, yesterday we were out in Hook Park, you know, engaged in these, in these projects. The students are there now. And I guess just to reiterate that kind of through this process, we are looking for opportunities to reciprocate between designing and making. You know, that we're not just doing the kind of conventional office you know, office project, sit down at a computer screen for, for two months and draw a project and then go and, or hand that over to someone else to make it. We're looking at ways to test to um, integrate those two activities. So two ongoing projects, um, a low-cost dwelling, so a student lodge with an explicit um, low-cost ambition, um, and a very different project, um, a timber seasoning shelter, effectively a canopy, but an opportunity to, um, to really test a sort of exploration in the material system. So within the cohort, you know, the students kind of chose a bit uh, whether they wanted to take on, I guess, a full architectural proposition, you know, a, a complete sealed, um, environmentally sound building, or something which was more of a, um, you know, more experimental in terms of its um, materiality. So sort of just running through the first one, so I guess, I mean, there's a couple of motivations. One was to really exploit... Um, kind of upcycling opportunities and um, you know, found materials. Um, another thing they tested very early on was directly one-to-one -one mocking up um, 
volumetrically mocking up the, the proposed building on the site um, and you know, developing the landscape relationships through that mocking up and then very literally inhabiting the drawing. So they were literally sketching, drawing, chalk lining that on the big shed floor, testing out kind of arrangements of furniture, you know, just reciprocating again between you know, the, the full scale world and um, you know, the conventional drawn world. And I guess that extends into the actual material aspect as well. You know, the, the, there's never really been a drawing set. There's been a set of drawings that are evolving and being updated according to the constructed reality. Um, and I guess that's also reflected in the kind of material sourcing. So they've um, been donated. They basically you know, they sent flyers around everyone who was making or selling windows within 50 miles or something. And they've been do donated lots of... Um, <coughs> discarded windows so this is kind of the the catalogue of all of those sizes so they've been again kind of working with that at a kind of one-to-one -one scale to kind of patchwork that into the um into the design of the building and similarly with other materials so there's slate that have come off actually the building that were, they were living in some of the students was being re-roofed and they reclaimed a set of those slates and are incorporating that in the design um and then the cladding right down to the cladding they're really trying to i guess you know, communicate explicitly the sort of very economic use of the um, the timber material. So they've got a, a strategy basically for um, sawing up the tree and literally using every part of the, the tree as it's sliced in the cladding system. So this was taken yesterday, so the building's substantially complete. Um, it's waterproof, um, cladding's going on, um, sort of view of the, of the rooftop there. Um, bit of interior lining still to do in bits and pieces. Um, the timber seizing shelter, very different kind of project. So um, the brief for this was basically to provide a, a sheltered space for storing timber so that it would season and be um, basically more usable than, than wood that's just been cut down. Um, so it basically has to provide rain shelter and the right airflow to encourage the timber to dry. Um, I guess the starting point for the students' reaction to that brief was an analysis of the timber in the woodland. A big proportion, I think 60% of the plantation is beech wood, which at the time was anticipated as being of high value for furniture making, but in reality nowadays, and I kind of IKEA times, it's not. Um, so they had this motivation to rehabilitate um, beech as a construction material. Um, so literally going out, you know, this is Megan, the student, you know, with, with the forester, with the the fella, you know, with the, um, the lumberjack to, to look at the trees and kind of think about how they could be used. Another um, person he spent some time with was um, a local furniture maker who was steam bending, had a very kind of sophisticated steam bending set of techniques. Um, so the project kind of evolved, I guess, out of a motivation to make an interesting structure out of the beach, and deploying the steam bending technique. Um, so using... Um, very efficiently cut, so very efficiently cut planks, um, but giving geometric freedom through um, variable steam bending. So this is probably February, March time, I suppose. So this is the first um, prototypes of a pneumatic steam bending jig to uh, um, create these um, bent components. Um, early kind of assembly tests. This is Omri, the student working with Charlie, who I mentioned and Francis Archer, the structural engineer. At this point, the structure's just, um, all the pieces are the same, so they're, it's a planar structure. Um, Glenn, within the group, developed the digital uh, model to allow the definition of each piece, to be, each component to be different. Um, and this evolving development of that bending jig to allow this variation to be um, accomplished. So this is, I think, the first sketch of the idea of a, an overhead projector that, um, Describe the geometry of each piece, you know, adjustments to the to the jig arrangement to allow each of these pieces to be bent. So, you know, that evolved into a kind of re a real piece. I think that was um, I think that was the day of the first real bending. All the superimposed components just shown in diagram. Um, so this has been running now since July, I guess, producing the pieces. I think they just got 20 of the 180 left to bend. Hopefully, they've done another five or so today. Um, so you get what's happening here. So. These are uh, initially straight pieces of beach that have been steamed in a steam box and then dropped into this thing. Pneumatic actuators is bending them into shape, pairs of them being clamped together. And these are 
you know, explicitly created and defined to exactly fit together in the right way within this um, structure. So then assembling larger patches of this stuff. Um, so I think there's going to be four patches a little bit bigger than this that will then get brought together to form the canopy on site, um, which should happen in about four weeks' time. Um, okay, that's that project. So I guess just to give you a flavour of the sort of, um, I guess the extremes of the, the type of um, work that designer make students do. Okay, there's the projects. Um, so I guess this, in a way there's two fundamental outputs from the student's perspective. There's a built project that they've designed and there's this thesis, you know, there's an intellectual piece of work that kind of consolidates the, um, the activity and the thinking that's gone on over these 16 months in a, in a written document. Um, you know, we see it as important to go through that exercise, you know, that it's you know, to kind of close the loop to really fully reflect on what's been done. Um, I guess the thesis has two kind of fundamental requirements, that it does draw on the built project in some way it analyzes an aspect of that project, you know, the student's role within that, and that it's propositional, that it's not just a record of the um, exercise or just a kind of, you know, scientific analysis. It's actually making kind of active um, propositions in architectural terms, so whether that's relating to practice, um, the kind of technologies of architecture, um, you know, modes of design, but there is actually a proposition that comes out of that. Um, a list of thesis titles from last year, maybe at a glance you get a little bit of a sense of the, um, the kind of realm of the topics of the thesis. Um, I think just to kind of close, this is a diagram out of Nozomi's thesis, so um, students involved in the Big Shed project. Um, she analysed in a lot of depth all of the kind of communication relationships um, within the project team relating to the tolerance of the structure. So basically, how we ensure that that project all came together. Um, and so drew out of that a quite an interesting you know, proposition about um, sort of alternative way of representing um, architecture within a design project. Okay, I think that's more or less it. Um, there's Nozomi within that within that project of hers. Um, I hope that's reasonably clear. Um, hopefully a lot of you will be down at Hook Point at some point during the year with a, you know, I think they all tend to visit MTech. Um, I think we're doing a joint little workshop over a weekend with the AAIS programme in a couple of weekends' time. So anyway, hopefully see a lot of you down in Dorset. Thank you.